All right, as the uh, offering bags are being passed, I'm going to throw out a, a quick disclaimer. Um, I am ready to be on a couch with a blanket and some sweats. I caught something a couple of days ago. Well, maybe amen for a different reason. I am feeling pretty rough. And so I'm going to, uh, I just hope this doesn't fall too flat, but we'll, we'll get through this. I appreciate uh, everyone being here tonight, knowing that we don't have a current, well, we, our, our current kids ministry is, uh, is, is dried out. It was underwater after that sprinkler uh, head went, and uh, we are working on getting that uh, put back together as quickly as we can. And so we will intentionally try to keep these messages uh, short uh, so we can get, uh, we, we know little ones can get uh, a little bit antsy after too long. But so we're just going to go ahead and jump right in uh, into tonight. So our our passage, our main passage that we're going to hit tonight is out of Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Uh, it's going to be up here on the screen, so let's just read it together. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what's interesting about tonight is I, I tried really hard uh, to get out of speaking. Uh, I knew Kayla was going to be out of town tonight, uh, and uh, so for the last month, um, we've been, uh, trying to get a hold of uh, Pastor Toby. He's been on, uh, uh, sabbatical, but, uh, to see if he'd be willing to step in and cover us for tonight. As you know, most of us, we've been, uh, struggling, fighting some, some health issues over at home. And most recently, the new, the, the newest uh, development is, is my poor wife needs her gallbladder removed. And so she's been having issues with gallstones for about a month and a half. And after using the term gallbladder so often, how's your gallbladder? How's your gallbladder? We just nicknamed the stupid thing Bob because it was just so much easier to say, how's Bob doing today? Well, Bob's not behaving. And so there's a lot going on in our lives. And to top everything off, that, 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 that Andrew has struggled with, Bob has refused to behave himself even with the threat of eviction. So with home life and a number of different things going on here, and now Andrew needing to kick Bob out. I just, I didn't really know what this last week was going to look like. And so I, I just asked, I asked Caleb, I said, man, can you, can you talk to Pastor Toby, see if there's any way uh, that he may be able to come here tonight and minister to us. So finally, uh, the Thursday before last, about two o'clock in the afternoon, Caleb calls me and he goes, okay, here, here's the deal. Okay. Toby is willing to come speak. And I, as soon as he said that, I just kind of put my hands in my face or my face in my hands, and I said, but, and he said, well, but, he, he, he said this, he goes, he, go, he, he goes, what if you consider putting this before the Lord, before he agrees to come in? He's, he's willing to do it, but he, he would like you to just, you know, pray on it and see what the Lord has to say, and I, you know, I've, I've, I've been at this long enough to know that when somebody says something like that, what they're really saying is, I already know what the Lord wants to do with this, and I'm just waiting for you to get the same understanding, and so I hang up the phone, and of course I'm going to pray on it, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty certain at this point, my, my rotation is, is up. So then an hour and a half later, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm working away, and, and the sprinkler blows in one of our offices. And so uh, you have that, and then quickly ensues the chaos that comes with everything with that. You have the insurance, remediation, more insurance, construction, more insurance. There were a few times this past week I thought I was literally going to lose my mind. So like I said, I really tried really hard to get out of tonight. But here I am, and as I was thinking about all this over this last week, and thinking about this, this verse out of Philippians that we're in, I find it interesting that, as is, is Paul, this is out of chapter 4, it's the last chapter in, in, in Philippians, and so Paul is beginning to close. Don't put that up there yet, we're, we'll get there. Um, we're getting there. Paul starts the letter, or starts chapter 4, with rejoice. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. And so it's interesting that Paul, at the same time, it's not only interesting that he said rejoice, it's also interesting that he was in a Roman prison at the time that he wrote this letter to the church in Philippi. Now granted, at this particular time, Paul was most likely under house arrest, which would have been a better environment than an underground dungeon that he, you know, has found himself in the, in the past. But even in the times that he was in a dungeon, his his, his tone throughout every single letter that he wrote never changed because Paul learned to rejoice regardless of his, his circumstances because he knew that God is bigger than any circumstance that he would ever encounter. Okay, now we can throw verse 6 up there. So Paul goes on to say in verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
present your request to God. And I, and I look at that, and, and, I, and I read, do not be anxious. Now, how many of you would consider yourself to be an anxious person? I am, an, wow, more than I thought. I'm an anxious person by nature. I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say I struggle with anxiety, but I get anxious fairly easy if there's something that's out of balance or I find that I can't control what? I can't control the outcome. We like to be in control, right? We like to know what's going to happen. We like to be in charge of things that are going to affect us. We don't have to be in charge of everything. I don't want to be in charge of everything. But if there is a circumstance that is going to affect me or my family, I want to try and grab a hold of that wheel. And I want to try to take over because I know, right? I know what a favorable outcome looks like. But what does Paul say? He says, in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then what happens? Verse 7, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul did not write, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by your will and your strength and in your own understanding, take over and do whatever you need to do to gain control. But how often do we do that anyways? I could easily take what I just said and call it Jason 4-7. That's blasphemous. I get it. It's not a verse. But I could. I could say, this is Jason 4-7 that I have learned, and I have learned the hard way, I might mention, that I don't have the Midas touch. I try to get in front of the things that, that, that God might be trying to do. Um, let, let's put it this way. There, there, there are times that, 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 that an unpleasant circumstance, if you will, will come up, and I'll react to to fear, I'll, I'll react with fear in this situation, okay? But how many of us know that there's a stark difference between reaction, be, between reacting and responding? Amen? Okay, so I react, I react, my go-to is Jason 4-7. In every situation, by Jason's will and Jason's strength, and in your own understanding, take over and do whatever you need to do to gain control of the situation. But that's wrong. Because every time we do this, it begins to add weight to a yoke that we were never meant to carry. We all have this stuff going on around us all the time that we call life. And it never seems to to stop, let alone ever actually slow down. And it can feel like if if we even try to attempt to slow down, that life continues to go before us at the same speed. And sometimes it's just all that we have to be able to to just keep up. And I'll speak for myself when I say this, but I'm, I'm, I'm positive that I'm not alone, that it's true for a lot of us, that too often... I fall to my go-to of, I, I, I got this. I can handle this. Give me more. I got it. I can handle it. And sometimes it feels like it begins to become my, my battle cry. But my battle cry, our battle cry, if we're doing things right, should be Jesus. And as I was thinking about this this past week, I got this visual of the junk lady from the movie Labyrinth. Anyone ever seen the movie Labyrinth? A couple? Okay. It was a movie I used to love when I was a kid growing up in the 80s, and I thought it was such a cool movie, and I, I actually I, I, I showed Andrew a couple of clips uh, from the movie, and it's like, man, that, that movie's stupid. But I remember when I was a kid, I was, I was looking, at, looking at David Bowie. It's like, man, I wish I had hair like David Bowie. <laughs> Dare to dream. All right, let's throw that picture up there. So this is the junk lady from the movie Labyrinth, okay? She's part of the junk people. They live in the junk fields of the Labyrinth, and all they do is they collect junk and they carry this junk on their backs. They find more junk, they add it to their junk pile. And we do this in life and we carry this heavy burden of stress and problems and fear, this burden of junk. And after a while, all this junk, this yoke that we have found becomes too heavy and the sheer weight of it begins to crush us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, he said, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and you will learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, again, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So responding with prayer is the right answer. The things that make us anxious, we take those things to Jesus. And he will guard our hearts, and he will guard our minds, and he will give us peace, and he will give us rest, because his burden is what? His burden is light. The circumstances of our lives are not always going to be pleasant. Nowhere in the Bible did any author ever say that God wouldn't give you more than you can handle. But yet we hear that all the time. God won't give you more than you can handle. Really? Prove it. Nowhere in the Bible 
is it ever say that God will not give you more than you can handle. In fact, it's quite, oftentimes it's quite the opposite where we will receive more than what we can handle. Jesus himself said in, in John chapter 16 that I have told you these things so that you may have peace. There's that word again, peace, because in this world you will have trouble. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how often. We so often, we want to take the promises of, of God that speak of blessing and praise Him, yet at the same time, we find ourselves surprised that the normal Christian life oftentimes comes with hardships that are too much for us to handle. These are things that I know, but yet I find myself surprised and I get frustrated when I get this huge pile of poop thrown through a fan and flung all over my life. I'm just going to give time for that visual to set in. Pastor Jason covered. That's actually that's actually kind of gross. Let's <laughs> let's let's maybe I think a better visual would be a wave or like a, a tsunami. It looks like it's gonna swallow me up. You see, we all have things in this life that we're waiting for God to come through on. And maybe it's a relationship that's been promised to be resurrected. Maybe it's to, to be released from an, an addiction that we've been battling. Maybe it's for a, the opportunity to be able to start a family. Maybe it's for a family member, a specific family member that, we are in, that, that, we're, that we're praying for. Maybe it's a healing that we're waiting for of some kind. Whatever it is, I'm sure that every single one of us here tonight have something that we're waiting on God to do for us, something that he has promised, right? We've prayed for it. We've petitioned for it. God has said, okay, I'm going to do it. And then nothing happens. Or maybe everything goes sideways. And we catch ourselves saying, this was not part of the deal. There was this great message that I'd watched a few weeks ago by Dr. Tony Evans called How to Trust God During the Worst Storm of Your Life. And it was out of Mark chapter 4 when Jesus finishes this full day of ministering. And then he tells his disciples, all right, let's get in the boat and we're going to go to the other side of the lake. And so we know the story. There's this ferocious storm. They get in the boat. They're crossing the lake. There's this ferocious storm that begins to, it threatens to sink the boat. And the disciples are there, they're, they're in a panic. And Jesus is out cold in the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. And all the disciples knew is that Jesus told them the destination. He said, this is where we're going. And off they went. Jesus never told them anything that they would have to go through to be able to get to the other side. He didn't tell them about the storm that lie ahead. And I wonder why. Maybe he didn't think that the storm was a big deal. I mean, after all, he, was, he would have slept through the whole thing. Um, maybe he knew that the, the, the disciples would have backed out had they known what was in front of him. The truth is we don't know why Jesus didn't say anything, why he didn't tell the disciples about the impending storm. The only thing that Jesus said to them, at least according to how Mark records it in his gospel, is that they were going to the other side. But we can hit stormy seasons where all we can see is the waves and all we can hear is the wind and all we can feel is the cold. And we cry out, Jesus, don't you care? I'm about to drown here, man, and you're sleeping. But what, what did Jesus say when he, when, when he calmed the storm? He said, quiet, be still. And the waves and the wind obeyed and then he looked his, at his disciples and he asked them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And I don't know about you, but the battlefield of the mind for me is often is, is, is too often one of the biggest battles that I that I fight, along with the constant question of, of, of what if, right? What if this doesn't work? What if this happens? What if this person does this? What if this situation goes south? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And Jesus says, quiet, be still. Jason, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And have you ever noticed that the what if game, it always revolves around the worst case scenario? Yes. Did you, ever, did you know that there is only one way to please God? Of course, living in such a manner that reflects and pleases Him, reflects who He is, pleases Him, but there, there's a key ingredient that without it, it is literally impossible to please God. What is it? Without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But faith is a muscle that has to be built, and it has to be built in the gym of trusting. So why does God give us more than we can handle? Because he wants us to trust him with those big things so that he can prove himself faithful. He wants to change the narrative from a negative what if 
to a narrative of what if I showed up and I did exactly what I promised I would do? He is patient. God is not on a timeline in the same way that we put him on a timeline. I've caught myself so many times of I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed for like five minutes. <laughs> and nothing happened. What the, what the heck, Lord? How often do, do we clock God's answer to our prayers with an egg timer before we then choose to go and move on our own efforts? The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. And so rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, because the Lord is near. So do not be anxious about anything. In every, in every, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Jesus says, come to me, for my burden is easy, and I will give you rest, and I will give you peace, and I will take care of you, and I will protect you. You only need a little bit of faith. And when you see me prove faithful on the other side of this, you will give me thanks. But we cannot wait to give thanks to God for what he is going to do. The author of Hebrews tells us that faith is the insurance that what we hope for will come about, and it is the certainty that what we cannot see actually exists. We're called to move in, in confident expectation and faith that God will do indeed what he said he will do, even though we can't see it right now. Even though the evidence is lacking, even though it doesn't make sense, we're called to believe without first seeing. And so often when we, we're going through hardships, we can forget to be thankful. We look at verses like the one in Philippians tonight, and we read not to be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition to present our requests to God. But when we read it like that, we leave out a very important concept, a concept that some would say is the key to unlocking the blessings of God, and that is thanksgiving. It's by prayer and petition with thanksgiving that we are called to, to, to present our requests to God. And when we give thanks, it forces us to remember what Jesus has already done. It reminds us of where he has already been faithful, and it helps us to see what he might be doing right now. You see, thankfulness opens up a heart of gratitude, and it changes our perspective from what we need and what we don't have to what we have already been given, what's been done, and what will be done. And I love how in just a few simple sentences, Paul records all of this in his letter to, to the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 3. It says, praise, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. Now this is huge, because after his conversion on the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul experienced a lot of in, in his words, what, he's, what he calls trouble. I've, I had a lot of trouble. And so jumping to chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, Paul provides an entire list of everything that he had gone to up to this point. He says that I have worked much harder and been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, and I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from de Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger of false believers. I have, been, I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have, been, I have known hunger, and I've known thirst, and I've gone without food, and I've been cold, I've been naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern with, for all the churches." Can you imagine? I find it almost comical that Paul gives this list, and at the very end, he says, if that wasn't all enough, I'm trying to oversee all these churches. I have one church to help oversee, and here I'm complaining about a broken sprinkler head and all the inconvenience that is caused. But despite all these things, going back to verse 3 now, despite all these things, Paul still gives praise to God because, God's, because of God's comfort and compassion in his times of trouble. It's Thanksgiving. And I, and I love and respect Paul's response to his trials. And so picking up in verse 4, Paul writes that we praise God who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. 
You see, the ability to be able to empathize with another person is powerful. The series that we just, that actually, we didn't just finish, and we'll finish it next week when, when, when Caleb's back, Touch the Leper, it was about getting out and bringing hope to the lost, speaking God's goodness to those who don't know Jesus. And that is so vitally important. But you know what? People who know Jesus also go through severe trials, and they need to be ministered to as well. There's a wide open field outside these walls that is full of ministry opportunity because guess what? The leper is just not the person who doesn't know Jesus. It's anyone that needs the hope and the assurance or reassurance for that matter of Jesus Christ in their lives. Because only a person who has battled cancer can empathize with someone who is newly diagnosed with cancer. Only a person who has grieved the loss of a child can empathize with someone who has just lost a child. Only a person who lost everything can empathize with somebody who has just lost everything. Only a person with cystic fibrosis can empathize with somebody who has cystic fibrosis. Only a person who has gone through ninth grade biology can empathize with someone who's struggling with ninth grade biology. There's about a month ago, Andrew and I were trying to help Samira I get I, finger quotes. We were trying to help her study for this biology test, and it was rough. I mean, it just it wasn't going well. And all of a sudden, she blurs, she she burst out. You don't know what it's like to be in the ninth grade. <laughs> nope, because mom and I both skipped the ninth grade. No, we did not. <laughs> the trials that we go through, while unique to us. They're not unique in nature. And what I mean by that is that everyone here has or will go through something that most people won't experience, but some will. And if we can find the ability in the midst of the storm to praise and to give thanks, to allow Jesus to comfort us just as he was comforted by the Father before the crucifixion, what an opportunity we will find to minister and to bring glory to the name of Jesus when we support others going through the same thing. Verse 6, if we are, Paul continues, he says, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and your salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And your hope for you, and our hope for you is firm because we know that it is just as you share in our sufferings, so you also share in our comfort. Verse 8, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles that we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And I love that part. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but rather that we would rely on God. It's trust. We may have an assignment or a calling, something that God is calling us to do, but how, how often do we like to try to help God along? Am I going to react to the situation or am I going to respond? Am I going to try and wrestle, for the, wrestle the Lord for control or am I going to cling to Jesus in everything with everything that I have, just as Caleb discussed last week? Am I going to pray and give thanks for what he is doing and what he is going to do? Verse 10, he has delivered us from, from such a deadly peril that he will deliver us again. And on him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. And then many will give thanks for our behalf for the gracious favor granted us to the prayers of many. There's faith. He has delivered us before. And he has delivered us again. Yeah, so think of, think of where Jesus has, has shown up in your life. Where has he shown up in your life in the past? His faithfulness in all things to you. This is, this is all the things that the Lord has already done for you in the past and up to this point. Those things prove his faithfulness. And also they, they, it, it proves that he will do what he has said he will do both now and again in the future. So give thanks for what he has done and give thanks for what he will do. 
And finally, in the last part of the verse, Paul mentions that the church in Corinth has helped him and his various travel companions by their prayers. In almost all his letters, whether to churches or individuals, Paul opens in thanksgiving to them. And he reiterates how he prays for the peace and the mercy of Jesus Christ over them. Paul was a thankful, thankful man who surrounded himself in community. And in this life, you are only ever alone if you, if you choose to be. We have the benefit of a wonderful Christian community, but even, even better than that, we have a God in heaven that loves us more than we could ever possible dream, possibly dream. The author of Hebrews in chapter 4, he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize. Oh, who is unable to empathize. Jesus can empathize with whatever it is that we are going through, and so we can give thanks. We can put that burden before him. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. And so let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may be able to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see, we have a wonderful Savior in Jesus Christ. And as I was praying over this message this week, there's a song that, that keeps coming up on, on my playlist called Defender. And I just thought it was so appropriate that we, we close tonight with this song. It's a song of, of, of recognition. You just never know when something's going to catch you. It's a song of recognition of giving everything over to the Lord. That He will go to battle for us when we can't. And all we have to do is just give praise. It was, it was originally written out of Exodus 14 when the, the Egyptians were coming upon the Israelites and, and Moses and the Israelites are standing at the Red Sea. It's like, well, either we get slaughtered or we drown. I don't know what to do. And the Lord says, just be calm and stand still and, and watch that I will fight for you. So let's stand together because we're going to celebrate God's goodness with this song. Because he is a wonderful defender with us in every circumstance by giving the Lord a, a holy outcry of thanks. Just praise Him. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are you are always good. We thank you that you can be trusted. We thank you that there is not one promise, Lord, that, will, that you have made that will ever, ever, ever go unfulfilled. We thank you that you care for us, Lord. You collect your, our, our tears in your bottle. You rejoice with us, Lord. You put us on a high rock. You've redeemed us, Lord, and you have called us your own. And for that, we give you praise. And in Jesus' name, we give you thanks. Amen.